And so we'll say, welcome, um, it's June. And this month we're talking about urushi ori, a type of lacquer weaving. And so let's take a look at what we have in the video for today. Okay, here we go. So urushi is actually lacquer, real lacquer. Um, and there are, it started out as real lacquer, okay? And of course, there are a variety of modern adaptations that have been introduced. But when you're looking at the real thing, the first thing you want to do is often the bolt will say what it is on the end of it. So in this case, the first circle, let me stop here just a second, said, uh, I'll go back here, teori obi. Okay, so it's a handwoven obi. Okay, and then the second circle here says Nishijin Ori, which tells us it was woven in the Nishijin district. And as we've discussed before, a lot of times people will refer to Nishijin as a category of textile, but not from a Western point of view. It's a category in the sense that it tells you the district in which it was woven. But all kinds of fabrics are woven in the Nishijin district. It's just known for its quality. So when someone says, oh, that's Nishijin Ori, usually they think they're saying a tapestry or a complex jacquard. But of course, in reality, it means many more things than that. Textile, okay. right? And moving along, uh, let's see. Okay. So moving along, then the next one is uh, this character here, which talks, it says, Shu uh, Urushi Shio. So Shu, it, Shu is vermilion, so you can see the orangey color here. Normally, real vermilion is made from uh, arsenic, and that would then be, which is uh, cinnabar, you know, like the Chinese red beads, okay? And so that would be added to the Urushi substance, the lacquer, the syrup from the lacquer tree to create the orange color. And of course, iron rust could be added is the piece that you see here. Okay, the iron rust has been added to lacquer to produce this piece. So a variety of colors can be added. Um, and with the lacquer sap being the carrier for the color. So let's take a look at this piece. This is actually a piece from the Jomon period in Japan. It's a comb. Jomon period started about 7,000 years ago. However, this particular piece is probably not more than 2,000. But if you stop and take a look, they, they reproduced it for our purposes. Um, what they have is a very beautifully woven bast fiber yarn that is holding a range of basically skewers, bamboo sticks together. And so the upper part that looks like a fudge sickle here, okay, is actually um, covering the woven section that's been dipped in lacquer to hold it together as a glue, basically. And then what you'll find is the tines um, where the weaving stopped were also coated in the lacquer. So it was an exquisitely produced, technically sophisticated lacquer comb produced nearly 2000 years ago. Now, the method that they used of producing it hasn't changed all those years. So in the old days, sorry, let me back up here just a minute here. So you can see the Jomon period fellow here. He's using perhaps a shell, perhaps something else to notch the tree, to score through the outer bark to the inner bark, which causes the tree sap to weep. So it's very much like collecting maple syrup by scoring the side. And that technique has not changed over these thousands of years. So here's a contemporary craftsperson doing exactly the same thing using metal tools in this case. And what she's doing is she's scoring sections of the bark, scraping away the excess roughness so it's easier to collect the sap, and then collecting it. So these are the basic tools that she would use. You can see they're, they're fairly basic. Um, she's going along scraping out things, but unlike maple syrup, you don't you don't leave the bucket there for it to drip in overnight. It drips so slowly and it oxidizes so quickly that basically you have to collect it very shortly after scoring the tree. And you collect it really pretty much drop by drop. So we're not talking about something that's running or dripping heavily. It's just this little bit of ooze and you see she has this special curved little uh, spatula-like tool that she'll collect it as long as she can before it seals itself up. 
So again, we're not talking buckets full at a time or you know um, buckets full in the course of a day. We're really talking about uh, you know at best a cup full or two, but that's collected, um, and it depends on the size of your lacquer farm, of course. Here you see they've added the cinnabar to the lacquer, and he's now coating handmade sheets of paper with the lacquer, simply using a spatula, much like the one we use in, in applying paste to stencils. And this paper is set at this width because that would be the standard width, the orange part, that would be used in a Japanese weave selvage to selvage. Now, there are a lot of these papers. You see the blue, so it's had indigo or perhaps azurite added to the lacquer, the cinnabar added to the orange that you see here and so forth. This paper that they're using is exactly the same paper that's used in a 10,000 yen note. It's very thin, it's very strong, and it stands up to a lot of wear. So here's a sheet I have with the real lacquer applied. And you can see it's not limited to lacquer. The lacquer, as I said, is a carrier. It's a binder of sorts. So you can apply lacquer and then put silver leaf on top, gold leaf, bronze, a combination of things. You can take gold flecks and sprinkle them. You can paint designs. You can stencil designs. There are all sorts of imagery and colors and uh, nuances that can be added to these designs because those will then later be woven into the textile. And this one is very subtle, but particularly beautiful, where different types of lacquer have been added to give it a little bit of a sheen. Perhaps you can see the slight blue cast on your screen. Shadings of gold dust over the top of it, where uh, silver dust is sprinkled and adjacent to that, the gold. Now, once that's all done, if you're going to weave with it, you go back and you shred the threads. Okay, you're basically making threads out of them. You you thread the paper, excuse me, you shred the paper. Now, just to review back earlier, in one of our earlier videos, we covered how the paper was laminated with gold. Okay, I believe that was under Karaori. So here she's gold leafing sheet by sheet, attaching it to the still damp lacquer, so it will stick. Then that lacquer is allowed to dry and um, it's shredded after that. The sample that you see here, these papers are all from my collection. I've got trunks of these, these sheets. Um, you can see that there's a beautiful variation in the types of gold that are used. That then gets shredded, as I mentioned. We saw that in the orange sample a moment ago. Now look at this particular sample. This is 24 karat gold on black lacquer. And if you can, notice this little swirl in each one. Well, remember back a moment ago when you saw her applying the squares? Perhaps in your mind's eye, you can imagine the square around each of these. And this is the part where she has taken the rubbing instrument, the little butt end, and she has rubbed in a circle to make sure that all the gold is flat and smooth against the lacquer, removing any bubbles or anything else. And it's this repeated action of rubbing the gold down into place that causes this swirl and is also a very beautiful decorative element. Okay, from the back, you can see it's plain paper. Now, one of the points I'll also mention when this kind of paper is prepared, and we did talk about this a little bit in the other video, um, notice how the threads are left in place. You're not just cutting a bunch of strips and then going on randomly weaving them. It's because you want that swirl pattern to remain intact. And if it's going to remain intact, you need to have all the threads lined up properly. So you only pick the strands off one at a time in order as you're preparing to weave with them. You can see how very fine these threads are. Now, for those of you who are familiar with Saga Nishiki, this is the same type of warp that would be used for that variety of weaving. We'll be covering that next year. So let's take a look at how, in a modern sense, the lacquer is applied. You saw the fellow applying the cinnabar um, impregnated lacquer a moment ago by hand. That's the traditional method. But in a more modern sense, where they're creating a very long warp, they're taking literally miles of handmade paper He's applying the lacquer to it. Now notice this, this sort of brush machine. Um, it's 
smearing the paste evenly side to side. And the metal sheet that you see pressing against the paper is making sure that it's scraping it so it has an even coat, just like the man's spatula did earlier with the orange. And once that comes out, from that roller in these long, long, um, still sticky lacquer sheets, okay? They collect them. These need to dry. They need, technically it's not drying, but they need to cure, okay? And they need to be handled very carefully. They may have the lacquer applied soon afterwards, or they may be allowed to dry as clear. There are many different uses for it. But the point is, it is miles of this stuff. Now, what we saw a moment ago was from the upper level. If you go down below where she's draping this paper, kind of looks like silk, but it is paper. Notice how they're draping it and very carefully spacing it so that everything gets even airflow through it. And they can then go back later when they're ready and wind it back onto a huge drum. And that's the point at which the woman earlier was applying the sheets of gold. Okay, so let's assume we have the sheets of gold all applied and we're done with that since we've seen that before. Now you have to turn it into thread. So in the old days, of course, that would be cut with a knife by hand. But in a modern sense, since you're dealing with such a long warp in this case, it's being cut by machine and then brought into these, uh, through these long series of channels and then wrapped onto the spools that will be used later. Now, this can either be a warp. In some cases, it would be a warp. In other cases, it might be kept as a spool for the weft. It's not commonly prepared this way if it's going to be used for a weft because you want to make sure the right side, the gold side, is up. However, in modern times, often they'll use mylar instead of paper. Uh, paper is also used. And when they're using something like mylar, they will coat it from both sides. That way, if it should twist while you're weaving, you still have the color showing. But let me stop for just a moment. This is a, a spool of the paper with the real gold on the paper. And so you can see in this case, there's gold on one side and the paper on the back. Okay, and so there are both kinds. There's the mylar base, which is very strong as a substrate, but it still has the beauty of the natural lacquer on top and other types of, of colorants. Or you have the choice of the paper, which is the older variety. The paper is not quite as strong, and so it's a little bit uh, less appropriate for a warp that's going to be uh, partially machine woven. And then, of course, you get all of these other wonderful opalescent colors modern through, uh, available through modern technology. And silver with the backing and paper. All sorts of shades of gold. So again, if you'll recall back to the Kata Ori piece, um, we did the gold chart, which different percentages of gold, silver, and copper combined to create a range of colors. And that's what you're seeing here. So also in the Kata Ori video, uh, we watched the woman wrap that flat thread around a silk core to create this type of yarn that's used in weaving. And in this case, you're not the least bit worried about it turning back to front because it's like any other yarn. It comes in all different weights. This particular weight is really sumptuous. It's, it's very oh, I don't know, very sensuous. It's sort of like if you've ever, I don't know, many of you have had the opportunity, but if you've ever held a really big hank of very heavy, high quality uh, hair on a Polynesian as an example, where it's wonderful, thick, very heavy quality, very beautiful, beautiful hair, feels very much like this, okay? I don't know how else to describe it. So these are things I've collected over the years, um, you know, and have these just stashed away here. Um, the OB are the same thing, of course. This is a double weave done with real lacquer. You can see the background blue has azurite added. The front has the iron rust. Now let's turn it over. This is the older style of paper lacquered thread, and you can see the white side from the back. And because it's a double weave, you wind up with this pillow-like, padded look to the different flowers and elements of the design. And of course, other types of silk threads are also in, incorporated in the imagery. And when we say lacquer, um, technically it means lacquer, like the lacquer tree. However, since it started that way, often 
any thread that's like that, including the gold ones that you saw earlier, those are also counted as lacquer weave. So Japanese terms can be confusing. Um, each textile has many different names by which it may be called. And so it just depends on which one the weaver or the sales agent is focusing on. So the what we're looking at here is not a terribly high quality. It's, it's better than most Western fabrics, but within the Japanese realm of textiles and lacquer weave, it's a little bit lower quality because the core is mylar and it's sort of a frizzy, um, very lightweight yarn and it causes a little bit of a crinkle but it also causes a lot more glitz to it and so it doesn't have quite the elegant sheen of the higher quality lacquer and they're very rarely real lacquer okay they're usually synthetic paints but they still have their own beauty and if you flip it over to the back you'll be able to see what those threads are like again they're, they're just a tad frizzy and we saw that at the beginning of this sample now these textiles um, let me stop for just a second. The, the majority of the high quality, real lacquer, uh, Urushiori in a contemporary sense, uh, those are used for obi. They're a little bit heavier, um, weightier. And so they lend themselves to a stiff obi, especially with the weaves and the flat thread. However, uh, traditionally, they were also quite often used in kimono fabrics and regular clothing, uh, you know, elegant clothing fabric. And so in this case, this particular artist has taken apart a Japanese urushiori silk and restyled it into a Western fashion. And the same applies to this piece. So as, as people are getting away from wearing kimono in Japan, they have this abundance of textiles and they want to keep the industry running. Then, of course, these are adapted to other types of uses, whether it's clothing, uh, upholstery, uh, cushions or handbags such as this. Now, these handbags are a bit pricey. Something like this can run easily $2,000 or more if it's hand lacquered, hand woven and, of course, from a very elegant shop. Now, in this one, you can see no lacquer at all, no, no real lacquer. These are all metallic threads on mylar, but this pretty, and you can see the gold in the background also. This is still, this still counts technically as urushi ori as a textile category because the technique started with the real lacquer. And this is another one, all metallics in this case, but it's still very much urushi ori. These are all a bit dated. Uh, most of what you're seeing are from the 1960s, 1970s are the samples you're seeing. And so they're not quite contemporary sense, except in a retro um, context, but they're still very, very high quality. Now, an interesting thing, we've already covered velvets to a degree in one of our earlier videos. So I am going to go ahead and introduce this type of sample. It, for a period of time was very common to combine elegant velvets with the urushi ori. Urushi ori in terms of metal or urushi ori in terms of real lacquer. And so here you can see the contrast of the phoenix in terms of the cut and the uncut velvet, as well as the extra oomph that the lacquer adds. Now the polonia leaves in this blue piece are real lacquer. And they have a nice sort of uh, deep luster to them. And in the velvet piece itself, you can see there are segments that are cut and segments that are not cut to, again, add greater uh, nuances and depth to the pattern. And the same thing goes for this piece. Most of these pieces you're seeing now were not kimono. Most of them were haori or michiyuki type garments. Okay, this one also is real lacquer. The peony in the center is real lacquer. And if we flip that over, you have a little bit better sense of the back here. Okay, now quite often these threads would be carried selvage to selvage in the weaving process and then clipped later. So here you can see the lacquered thread um, dipping in and out of the surface. And the same with the gold. In the gold, you can see the white back to some of the threads, okay? Um, 
And yeah, it's just a combination of those two. So once, if it's being carried selfish to selfish, when the piece is taken off the loom, quite often the uh, craftsperson, the weaver will go back and clip off all of the excess floats in the back to reduce the weight and just make it easier to wear and take care of later on. Okay, here again, this is all real lacquer and you can see how the lacquer threads have been incorporated in the larger jacquard weave. Simple, a very simple, very classy brown and black. Now, one of the things, what you see me doing here is rubbing it. If you rub side to side, so along the weft, with the weft, you get a very, very smooth feeling. But when it's real lacquer, when it's real lacquer that has been trimmed by hand, giving you a sharp edge, or by machine also in some cases, when you rub against the thread, your hand tends to catch a little bit. It's like, um, like petting against a snake's scales, okay? Your hand catches just a bit. Um, and that's an indication that it was hand cut. Those mylar ones that have color on both sides that you saw earlier, those, because they're coated later, the edge is rounded just a little bit and it doesn't, your hand doesn't do that, it doesn't catch. And so that's one way to try to figure out what type of fabric you have without taking your garment apart. Now I'm stopped for just a moment here because I want to, you to take a look at how this has been treated. Again, this is the cut and uncut velvet that we talked about in an earlier video. But in this case, what they've done is they've run this single flat gold strand in between each of the furrows of the yarn. So you will see them readily creating the outline of the maple leaf where there's no raised velvet loop. Okay, so there's sort of a blank area um, created by the jacquard loom. However, even in the very dense areas of velvet loops in between each of those furrows is a gold thread continuing selvage to selvage. And you only really have a sense of those as you move the yarn. Let me back up just a little bit as you move the fiber. Okay, so let's take a look at that one more time with that explanation. So again, you you really, a photograph doesn't do it justice. You have to see it in movement to appreciate what's going on here. Okay. And this was a Michiyuki garment. Another common use for this in contemporary sense are for mofuku, which are, um, morning clothes, clothes you would wear to a funeral or some such thing. And so in this case, the lacquered threads are going selfish to selfish with a lino weave. So this is a summer obi that would be worn to a funeral. It's very open, very light, very beautiful with the lacquered weave. And it doesn't have to be a funeral. If it were truly a formal occasion of some other sort, I suppose you could get away with it. But most often it's used just for funerals. And so the shiny parts are the lacquer threads, the flat lacquer threads. Now, going back to the sheets of paper I mentioned earlier, um, these are lar normally much larger in size. I cut these apart for another project, but I want you to take look, uh, take a look at all the different color ranges and so forth. Be and I want to review again the fact that you have to leave those in place when you cut them in anticipation of weaving. Otherwise, you would not get this pattern lined up. So when this paper was prepared, sheet after sheet after sheet, anticipating a repeat pattern, the weaver had to make sure once the threads were shredded, keep them in order so that you have these islands of color. Now, of course, because it's hand woven, you do get the slight shifting of the yarns as they're put in position, like you would in ecop. okay? Uh, nonetheless, the overall pattern does appear. Then one other thing I'm doing here, and I'll back up again just a spec. Sometimes I talk on past the point I was trying to make. So I'm going to look, this is a, a, a fukuro obi. In a fukuro obi, there's this section that would be on what's called the otaiko back of the obi. There's that little flap that hangs down just over the bottom, okay, and under the, the bow. That little section 
is usually turned up when being sewn. And quite often there's additional information in there. So what I'm doing right now is taking a peek to see if there are any clues as to what this fabric is. And as it turns out, in this case, there isn't one. Although I can tell just by feeling that this is real lacquer and a very, very nice quality weave. Again, it has that nice um, petting with the scales reptilian feel to it. Now this is, has exactly the same feel. It's of comparable quality. And you can see the gold in the background in combination with the lacquer. The deep peach color is lacquer as well as the black. Now, in this case, when you open up, look, there's quite a bit of writing in there. So if you're considering, if you had a flea market and considering buying one, look there. You can find real treasures that the uh, people around you might not be aware of. And so in this particular case, what it's saying, okay, let me stop here just a minute. This says honking, which means real gold or pure gold. And here again, it says handwoven, teori. And this one says hikihaku. Hikihaku means that um, it's been brush laminated on. Okay, so again, it's, it's leafed is what it's telling you. So it's real gold leaf and the handwoven textiles. Now in my enthusiasm to show you that part, I skipped right past the important part and that's at the other end of that section. And what this says is hong urushi, which means real genuine lacquer as opposed to a synthetic one, okay? And so again, it tells you everything you need to know that this is an exquisite piece of top quality. Now there are other kinds of labels that will come with something when they're new, that may not be woven into the end like that. This was for a Nagoya obi. So a Nagoya obi normally doesn't have that kind of an end to it. And in this case, the paper label that comes on it tells us that this is a traditional craft, okay? And this is telling you that it's real twill urushi, okay? And so here again, this is the genuine article. And this particular one is also a double weave as we saw back earlier with the other flower, creating this um, puffed raised section. Okay, and perhaps you can get a sense of that with the lighting here. And then last sample here, um, this one also has the same information on the edge in terms of being uh, real lacquer, hand woven. You can see by looking at the back how the strands have been laminated. And so again, your best bet in telling um, in finding out about any of these textiles is if you can open that and look at the back. And that's precisely why I've prepared your textile of the month samples so that you can view the back. That always tells us so much about what's going on. So again, thank you for joining me today. Um, let's see, let's go ahead and cut this off. Stop share, okay. So thank you for joining me today. And so we'll go ahead and continue on with our question and answers and um, anything there. Did that cover it? 